right, we're going to get started. I don't know what time it is. I don't know what time we're supposed to start, but now seems good. I'm Danvers. I'm here with Jessica Norman, and uh, we are uh, representing SmartPak, and SmartPak's one of the sponsors for the summit. Uh, this is our fourth year here. We're happy to be here, and it's, uh, it's going great. We're changing things up a little bit and talking about supplements for joint health. So if you missed what Jessica had to say this morning, she set the foundation and the theory for what we're going to talk, what I'm going to continue with from a more practical standpoint. So, but we're going to be in booth 7-Eleven. Uh, so stop in at the 7-Eleven <laughs> and, and you can visit with, uh, with Jessica more about the supplements and the supplement program that we offer. Uh, we're going to look at what, to me, is uh, one of the foundations for what I do in my daily work. Uh, I had it beaten into my head at an early point in my career. Uh, the first clinic that I went to, uh, the first horseshoeing clinic that I went to, was uh, Bruce Daniels. And we watched horses go for three days and talked about wear patterns for three days. And I realized that this was a whole lot more involved than I thought it was. So today we kind of take some of that for, for granted because we're practicing in a time of diagnostic awareness and, uh, and it's amazing what we have available to us with digital radiography and MRIs and CAT scans and so forth that uh, if you were shooting 15, 20 years ago, it was a whole different world. I mean, it's, it's amazing. So uh, we've also got other technologies available, force plates and things like that. And the most important thing is, is that so much of that is instantaneous. I mean, it's like you get results immediately. You don't like what that you see on that radiograph, shoot it again. Uh, it's just, it's phenomenal. But the real world is that most of us don't stand there with a vet with a radiograph machine watching what's going on with every horse that we shoot. We're still out there in the barns and mud and the dirt and sometimes in a barn and sometimes out in a paddock. And, uh, and we're still getting our information old school. We're watching horses go, interpreting footfalls, looking at landing and loading patterns, gathering data through our naked eye real-time observation, reading external capsules and their wear patterns, and reading and interpreting the wear patterns that the appliances that we are using are, are giving us. And so it's not diagnostics, it's observation. And it's not science, it's experience. And so you can't discount the importance of it, but you can't blow it up and try to make it something that it's not. It's simply observation. So recognize the limits, utilize what you can. And to me, that means that we're going to have to look at the value that it gives us. It, uh, how can that add value to your practice, the ability to look at these? And how can, how can you avoid misreading wear patterns? And what can, what can you actually read from a worn shoe? So the added value part, you're going to grow and learn. You may not learn the right things. You may learn something stupid and have to unlearn it. <laughs> I've done that many times. But, uh, but you're going to learn by simply looking. You're going to monitor and adjust. And I think this is a huge thing that we all need to think about and do as often and more often uh, in our practice is monitor what you see. Monitor what's going on and adjust accordingly uh, and learn from your mistakes. It's going to help you anticipate problems and uh, it's going to instill confidence in you, your own self-confidence, but it's going to instill confidence in the vets that you work with and the trainers you work with. They're going to say, oh, he saw that. He pointed that out. He told me it was happening and it's going to instill confidence. It's going to help you build professional relationships. And I think this is huge. Uh, if I'm observing 
and I see something and I point it out and say, you know, based upon what I'm seeing here, it'd be a good idea for you to get a vet in and get some diagnostics done. I've made a vet really happy. I've made him money. <laughs> and I've made a trainer happy because I've paid attention to the horse and anticipated a potential problem. I've made the owner happy because we're getting a problem taken care of before it becomes a bigger problem and before show season or whatever. So everybody becomes, uh, becomes a little bit better off. And I haven't overstepped and said, oh, well, you need to get this hawk injected. No. I said, I got, I got a wear pattern here that we need to look at. And I might, in my mind, be thinking, they're going to inject this hawk. But that's not what I say. <laughs> so, um, and you're going to get, as a result, you're going to get uninterrupted performance. So you're not going to have a horse that you see a problem with and right now that, get, that gets attended to before show season gets in full swing because you've said something. If I wait, if I see it and I wait, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have an interrupted performance season. That horse is, is going to come up lame in June and miss a week. So un uninterrupted performance is a huge issue. And performance is affected so much by joint issues and osteoarthritis and DJD and the issues that we're looking at. 60% of equine lameness problems are related to osteoarthritis. Inflammation of the hock joints alone affects more than 50% of jumpers and Grand Prix horses. That's huge. And, and we're the front line of defense again, against it. But we have to be careful because, like I said, this is not an science. This is experiential. You're looking and observing and making guesses, best guesses. So you've got to factor in all the variables and distractors that can be causing these issues. You got anatomy and conformation and musculature. You got terrains and footings that are varied. You got workload. You got material of your appliances that you're using, whether you're using a, a aluminum or steel, and whether that's any there's any consistency within that material. I mean, you uh, you all know that. You know, one brand of shoe is going to wear different than another. And even out of the same box, sometimes you're going to get different wear out of a pair. So you got to take that into consideration. You've also got to take in anything that you're doing to manipulate that, that before you ever start. You know, are you putting a wear pattern into it? Are you letting it put one in itself? So then you've got your length of wear and, and number of resets. And then you've got the huge element of habits and behaviors. Horses that are pawing, weaving, fence walking are going to establish wear patterns that are going to mislead us. So you can get misdirected off of anything. You got a horse that's got excessive wear at the toe. It could be heel sore. He could be toe sore. He could have thrush. He could have. Uh, he could be pawing. He could be overdoing his cycle. You could have set the shoe too far forward to begin with. I mean, you can't just look at it and say, oh, well, he's got wear here. I need to do something. You need to try to figure out why that wear is there. So that's, that's a huge element. So when we're reading shoe wear, what are we looking at? These, to me, are the main things. The position of the wear. Where is it? Is it in the toe, the heel, the quarter? Then we look at the orientation of the wear. Is it medial or lateral? Is it uh, at the toe? Is it at the heel? Is it on one branch or two? Um, and then we look at the amount of wear and, uh, and is determine if we think it's excessive. And then we look at the consistency of the wear, looking at pairs and our diagonals. So is it consistent from one, one side of the pair to the other? Is it consistent in the diagonal wear? So to me, those are the main things that we look for. <coughs> And typically, wear that covers a large area is going to be slide wear. Wear that covers a small focused area is stab wear. So 
Slide wear comes from keeping a foot on the ground. Stab wear comes from trying not to keep it on the ground. So if I stab my toe in the ground, I'm trying to get off of that foot. I just want to stick it in the ground and get it back off the ground. But if I'm wanting to stay on it, I'm going to set it down and keep it down and slide through it as much as I can. So, and we'll see that in our first pair of shoes here. I didn't have to look hard for these. I went out to my shoe stack and pulled them right off of the top. A pair of hinds that tell me that this horse has a problem. So I'll let you look at them for just a second. What are you seeing? I've got medial toe wear on this hind, and I've got lateral toe wear on this hind. I've got worn lateral branch on both, but on this one, it's excessive. This, from this point almost to the very tip of the shoe, it's worn almost twice as much. And I'd have to, you'd have to see the side view to see it, but uh, you can see it a little bit in this where you've got much more wear on this branch, especially here, than you do on this one. Uh, but the big issue is that I've got minimal wear in the back portion of this shoe. I've got medial toe wear on this shoe. Here I've got consistent slide wear on this lateral branch, and I, uh, it's breaking over laterally. And I don't know where it's sore. My guess is it's a hawk. But, uh, but that, that right hind, is he, he's not wanting to keep it on the ground. He's stabbing that medial toe into the, into the ground, and he's staying on his left hind longer. So if I watch that horse go, sorry, I'll uh, have to do my little dramatic thing here. If I watch him go, he's not going to go evenly. What he's going to do is he's going to do the same thing that you or I would. If my knee hurts, I'm going to try not to close that knee. So I'm going to, I'm going to step onto it. I'm going to quick stride off of it. And I'm going to take a long stride with my good leg and stay on it as long as I can. And then I'm going to quick stride. So I'm going to take a long, healthy stride on my good leg. I'm going to take a short stride on my sore leg. I'm going to come past the midline on, my, on that good leg to get that support base under me. And in the process, I'm going to get excessive wear on my lateral branch. And I'm going to get very little, very minimal heel wear on this because I'm trying to stay off of it. So I'm just going to stab it into the ground right there at the medial toe and never complete that stride. This is so subtle at this point that you'd have to be one of Tim Shannon's Olympic level riders to feel it. Your average rider is not going to feel this. Your average observer is not going to see it. And the way that most people view lame horses, you'll never see it. Because most of us put on them on a circle and run them around us. You send this horse dead away from you at a trot and you'll see it. You'll see that good leg come past the midline and that bad leg rotate out and abduct and, and just glance the ground as quick as it can and skip off of it. Watch your horse go straight away from you, you'll see it. You probably won't see it on a lunge line. So that good, unless I've got a really upper level rider, nobody knows this is happening. Nobody's seeing it, nobody's feeling it, except for me. I'm feeling it because that horse is tugging the hell out of me when he's standing on, on the sore leg. He's happy when I've got it in the air. So I got one leg that's easy to shoe and one leg that's, that's not. That ought to tell me something if I'm blindfolded. But then I look at the wear pattern and that tells me even more, shows me that I'm right. And says, I need to get somebody else involved. Point it out, think, I'm seeing something in this wear pattern that just doesn't make me feel good. I don't like it. Look at the wear pattern here. Call the vet. The vet's happy. The Cairo's happy. The trainer's happy. Don't forget, you and the horse are happier too. Because you're not going to get pulled and yanked as much. 
and uh, and that horse is going to feel better. So I think that's killer key important. There are things that I can do to make that horse's life easier, and I and I'll address them. But the important thing is is that I have pointed out something that is a problem before it becomes a major problem. And I have washed my hands of it to an extent by saying, hey, this is an, this is an upper leg problem. I'm seeing evidence of it, but it ain't in my, in my yard. So the best thing I can do for it is pass it on. I'm a resource person. You know, hey, everybody's happy. The, uh, now, what I can do is I can put that into this appliance before I apply it. I can give him a little rocker or uh, ease that point so that he doesn't have to fight it into a new pair of shoes. Uh, is, you know, it's probably, I don't like rockering or rolling toes on hind feet very much, but it's not going to diminish performance any more than, than already has. Uh, so I can do that. The other thing I do is, uh, depending on the footing, I'll often use uh, a plain stamp uh, or something because traction is your enemy in this case. And the more that that sticks and grabs, the, the more he's going to hurt. So There are several things you can do. But the most important thing you can do is flag it and get it addressed as quickly as possible. One of the things that Jessica talked about this morning is that that subchondral uh, bone has to be affected before we have joint problems. But before it's affected, you have, you have to have inflammation going on, and the cartilage in there is very odd and strange in the sense that there's, uh, it's not innervated, and it's not, there's no vascularity. So that horse isn't going to show a pain response and he's going to go along. He's going to have the issue, but he's not going to show a pain response until it's exacerbated and exaggerated enough that it starts getting into the subchondral bone. Then you've got the the problem. And it, but by that point, you know, so maintenance is key, and that's the reason that uh, that you should talk to Jessica about joint supplements and getting that in that sort of maintenance program involved and instituted instigated before there's ever a problem. It, you know, because at this point, there ain't no fixing that. I mean, it's there. And so we're gonna work on it, and the vet's gonna work on it, and the Cairo's gonna work on it, everybody's gonna work on it from here out. But if we can stave it off and make it happen in 2019 instead of 2017, everybody's gonna be happier, especially the horse. So, um, and since you said that, I'm going to skip those two and go to this one because I bet I'm almost out of time. Uh, this sort of wear pattern is something that we're, that I haven't seen a lot until the last couple of years. See that troughing that's coming out right there at the end of the fullering? And uh, I see that in horses that are in, working in synthetic footings and, uh, and it's traction and it's... Uh, it's this weird combination of grab and slide that happens at the same time. And when I can, and when I see it, and when I think it's an issue, I'm using more and more plain stamp shoes and trying to fight dealing with that. So, uh, and you see it there, troughing out of the end of that. But the interesting thing is you also see that trough right there in the branch alongside of the fullering. And to me, that's becoming more of a rotational issue. Uh, you can see it in these scratches on this shoe where they're, they're not in a straight line of travel. And when I see wear, uh, whether it's scratches or troughing or whatever, in that shoe that indicates that it's not straight line wear, I start worrying. Because that tells me that I, I have a rotation that's happening in the foot. Thank you for coming. Stop by and see us at the 7-Eleven store.